Are you thinking of building a home in the Fortville community? Hi, my name is Jessica Morrison, realtor with Ferris Property Group. And today we have Davis Homes. Davis has taken the stage in years past with being at the Indiana Home Show. And if you've had a chance to tour their products, they're beautiful. And quite um, so they've kind of found a niche in the affordability standpoint. And correct me if I'm wrong, Jared, there, but... Um, I feel like you guys as a builder have really uh, hit that niche well, but you also do a beautiful custom home. And so with us, we have David Shabazz, whose last name I just love. I love the, the energy that brings. And then Jared Klein. Um, we are going to first uh, turn it over to David. David is the sales rep. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. And yourself? I'm energized by this conversation already. <laughs> yeah, I'm energized as well. And, and, you know, we have a beautiful community at Park Creek that, that I manage and, and um, under the direction of Jared. And we have an uh, exciting, exciting product with a very popular community that, that we just developed here in the last 12 months. And it's been, it's been great. We've seen nothing but positive results from the community and, and from the folks that are, that are interested in Park Creek. So to recap, we are talking about Fortville and Park Creek, and how many yes. different communities do you as a builder have across Indianapolis right now? Oh, thank, thanks for asking. You know, our, our business model is a little bit different than, uh, than some of the others. So as an example, you know, the Pulteys and the Lennars and so forth, very good builders, all of them, but a little different setup. So we are a private, uh, locally owned company where those are national public builders. And uh, we don't have as many neighborhoods as they do. So our business model is different in that we have some communities like Park Creek, uh, but we only have, you know, kind of four or five subdivisions that we build in across Indianapolis. And then we do, uh, we we're the largest on your lot builder in central Indiana as well. So we, we for example, in 2020 sold, you know, uh, over 150 on your lot builds. So those are in subdivisions and those are rural, you know, could be on uh, some acreage somewhere a little further out, but a, even a 50 mile radius of, uh, of, of Monument Circle downtown. So a little different in our, in our setup uh, with that regard. Yeah, I feel like we're going to have to do a follow-up interview on that, Jared, to really go deep into how someone can find land and, and build with Davis, because it's a very unique product. And yeah. um, I do want to, at some point, have a conversation about, but about that, but I think to do it justice, we'll need to have another interview on the books. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a whole long conversation. <laughs> and um, yeah, for sure. Um, so David, turning back to Park Creek, um, what would you say makes Park Creek a special community or a hidden gem in the Fortville area? I say it's unique, not only from the, as you can see behind me, the exterior fronts, the craftsman's look, uh, but I hear folks that are uh, come from all over the city, all over central Indiana. They say, man, I wish you could build this in Avon. I wish you had this in Pike Township because of the, the, the craftsman's look, but also the urban feel. But we're out in a, in a rural area and uh, it just feels it just feels good. Uh, when you walk into our models, you're going to see an open space. We have a beautiful master down uh, floor plan um, that is our Hardwick. It's a new design and it just shows very well. But not only that, it's a smaller community, only 34 lots. We have uh, roughly 13 lots available. We've only been here for about a year and uh, we're excited about uh, the folks and the feedback that we're receiving. It's been quite uh, phenomenal to say the least to be in a town like Fordville where folks could give them additional option for new homes. It's, uh, it's quite refreshing is, the re is what we're hearing. I could add to that, uh, Jessica, the, you know, Fortville is really unique. It's a small, you know, very niche community, uh, neo-traditionally designed and, you know, all homes in there have, I mean, even back up, Fortville was really particular with what they wanted in this spot. It's, it's walking distance to downtown Fortville. Um, you know, they were really looking for homes that kind of fit a little more of a historic downtown look. So they, you know, they all have a, a, a garage that sets way back. So really kind of to, you know, to look like almost what would be an alleyway type of a look. 
but then with front porches on every home, uh, brick ribbons across every home, and just very unique, you know, craftsmen kind of mixes of modern prairie, modern farmhouse, you know, elements, but a, a more of a historic look to uh, to the neighborhood, and that really differentiates us from the area competition, and also uh, is it just in 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 price point. I mean, you can have that kind of a look at the price that we're able to provide. So subject to change, obviously, I mean, if you watch this interview a year from now, prices are going to be different, but as it stands today, where are your prices at? And what would you say is the range of minimum to maximum square footage for homes in this community? Well, if you will, uh, yeah, basically we're starting in that 260 price range uh, and we're seeing homes that are pricing and appraising from that 260 to, to about 360. I mean, that's about the the range that you're going to find in Park Creek. Uh, but, you know, everyone has different tastes. And that's one of the great things about this particular community and working with with Davis Homes is we're able to accommodate those those needs and wants. Uh, so it's been quite it's been it's been a great experience for our customers. What would you oh sorry <laughs> I'm playing with the mute button so the audio is clear as you guys talk so what would you say is um, either your most popular or most requested a uh, floor plan or feature when clients are walking through you know it's it's really been you know, two of them but our main one is our field view model which is what we have out in park creek it shows very well and and maybe when we do this again uh you can come out to our model uh, and have an opportunity to see it and, and let the folks that are watching see the model. But the field view model is really nice. It, it offers up to four bedrooms, five bedrooms uh, with a loft space, an open space. Uh, and then also our hardwood floor plan. Uh, once we have a, once we started showing that hardwood floor plan and folks started walking through it, it's just amazing the, the open space that, that you will see. Uh, and then all of the, the customizations that one can make, it's just, it's been really uh, uh, phenomenal to say the least. And as you can see from the different rendering, these different photos, you know, this is a, a photos of our models uh, that we have available, uh, which uh, we, we're getting, like I said, great feedback. Uh, once again, a small community. Um, and you definitely have to come, that's our, our model there, our field view. Definitely have to come out and take a look sometime. Yeah, it's beautiful. I love on that last photo how you had the um, finished room over the garage or frog as sometimes we call it as agents. Um, a lot of times I see, or if I have clients and they see just an empty space over the garage, they're like, oh, well, that, that could have been something. So it's neat to see on one example you have uh, when you were scrolling past, you had the footprint flipped and that one didn't have it, but in the last example with the model, you did have it. Um, so for this community, do you have the option to build basements or is that where the finished room over the garage comes in? And, and thank you for asking. The, the, that's really where in this community, the finished room over the garage comes in. And uh, with most of our designs, when you add that space, of course it reconfigures the second floor of the plan itself. Uh, creating a kind of a loft or bonus room type of a area or space. And then, you know, that space over the garage, which uh, is roughly 400 square feet, you know, can be used for bedrooms and part of that and part of that expansion. One of the unique, uh, you know, benefits of Davis Homes is, is that where a lot of your higher volume builders don't do any personalization. So, you know, we have we have the ability with our own in-house architectural team that if somebody wants to make, you know, some modifications because they've got a special, uh, you know, living circumstance, whatever that might be, you know, we have the ability to do that where some other builders just purely because of their size and their volume have more of a kind of take our plan or leave it approach. So we offer a little more personalization in that regard. Do you guys give credits for things that a client doesn't use or deletes? Like say, for example, um, tile might be included in the kitchen, but I'm like, no, I'd rather have a less expensive option. Do you do adjustments that way? Most builders don't, but since you are providing more of a, a semi-custom experience. No, that's that a good I'd question. Ask. We do. Um, so even, 
even to some extent, you know, sometimes people, you know, have a very specific uh, appliance type that they're looking for, and or maybe they have a connection that they can get a better price on that. You know, so there's certain things we can, and there's others we can't just, you know, we can do or not do. Appliances is one. If somebody would rather do their own, for example, we can just give them a credit, and they can do it after closing. Um, from a flooring perspective, that was a great example you used. Yeah, if somebody says, well, I'd rather have this type of flooring versus that type of a flooring. You know, today you're seeing on the design side, it's just amazing, you know, luxury vinyl plank is a real hot item. Uh, we've seen, you know, like ceramic tiles virtually uh, gone away. And, uh, and David's showing this picture now. So that flooring in there that's hardwood, it looks like a real hardwood floor is uh, this LVP, it's a waterproof product. We're seeing that in homes anywhere from 200,000 to 800,000 plus. It, it looks authentic. It's, I mean, I'm like, you can't say anything's indestructible, but it's pretty darn close and, uh, and comes in a great variety of, of color choices and design. So we'll absolutely work with customers in those circumstances. That's refreshing to hear, especially from an environment standpoint. Um, I think when we talk about sustainability and housing, one of the things that sometimes makes me scratch my head is how builders, and I think a lot of times too, like you said, it comes back to, are you smaller and able to cater more to a client's needs versus sometimes with the larger the company, the less flexibility they have, but it can just be a really big shame when the client really wants to do something in particular and they can't. And at the time of when the flooring is being installed, um, you know, they're just going to have to do a cheap option and rip it out. And then there's this not only wasting of money and labor, but also the materials, which impacts our environment. So it's, I'm not putting you on the hook for obviously all these custom changes, but it is refreshing to hear that there is an option at some point in that process for clients. Yeah, and there are certainly, there's things we can do and there are things that, that we can't. Um, but you know, that's our, you know, that's the conversation we can have that, you know, for many others, it's just, we can't, you know, uh, you know, communities like Park Creek, you know, one of the options is, is, you know, storage bumps, you know, we, we've created trying to, trying to predict at some level that, you know, the features that people want to have based just purely based on what, you know, consumer demand is. And on, on this community, for example, you know, virtually every home. Uh, and people are getting now, it seems like we're going to larger vehicles again, you know, so if somebody wants, a, you know, the, the back of the garage, you know, want to extend the garage deeper, uh, because of the design style here, we can actually go to the back side of the home. And, uh, you know, we have uh, almost every home in there, uh, with, with few exceptions, has at least a four foot by 12 foot or plus kind of a bump, storage bump, or I'll call a vehicle bump or you know, maybe they have a boat that they need a little extra space in and, you know, we, we can accommodate those, uh, those changes, uh, you know, uh, in, in a number of different ways. And also to add, to add to that, um, it's, it's refreshing to know that when, when I'm getting feedback from our, from our customers, that I can take that information to Jared and, and, and they can get together with the marketing team and the folks that make decisions in regards to our floor plans and say, what are those most popular options that folks are selecting or wanting? And then we take those into consideration and, and, and create an option for it. Uh, you know, I've seen that numerous times and, you know, customers say, hey, this is a breath of fresh air to be able to, to go to a builder that doesn't mind moving a wall. You know, it just, it's, it's, you'd be surprised. Yeah, so. I love it. Um, I cannot tell you how many homes I showed recently um, between like the 400 to 650 price point that were the client had a, a, a pickup truck and it, I, I felt like it was a more reasonable size truck, but it's still a pickup truck and those beds can be really long. And right. I had to measure uh, for this family because they were out of state and I would have to measure the floor to make sure that the truck could fit. And it was on top of an already challenging inventory market, trying to find something that fit um, the right criteria, which the criteria was great. Um, but a lot of times the house would be ruled out because the garage wasn't deep enough. And so, and these were even like 2013, 2014 you know, builds sometimes or even 2010. So not that long ago. 
Um, so it's neat to hear that that's something that you guys are paying attention to, obviously partially because of the conversations you're having with clients, but it's neat that you're adapting. And I think it's also a good reminder too that we are in Indiana. So <laughs> people are probably going to have more trucks or something rather than a smart car. But yeah. and if I could add one of the one of the big requests we've had this year, no surprise to anyone with with uh, COVID and the changes that's made in our world and people more people working from home is is that now you you know used to be you maybe had one office area and it was somewhat shared, uh, but maybe people weren't necessarily working from there. It was more of an after work workplace. And uh, now we're seeing you know, more people working at home and more circumstances where they need not just that one space that as builders we've all kind of had for years, but a secondary space. So, you know, I was talking a moment ago about loft areas and things like that. You know, we've been modifying those loft areas, modifying offices, study areas for children where, you know, they're trying to provide a, a space outside of just in a bedroom where there's some study space and workspace. And, uh, you know, we have that flexibility to, uh, you know, make modifications to a plan to accommodate those, or certainly we do our best to accommodate those requests. Yeah, I think it's interesting how the, as for your community, are basements an option or is it slabs only? I'd be a slab only. Okay, so that pre presents more of a challenge because then you have to be more creative with your main level and upper spaces, whereas right. basements do traditionally offer if you can't get the office on the main level then, or a second option is typically found in the basement because the loft is typically a kid's space. But um, what would you say, um, are there amenities in the Park Creek community as far as for those who haven't been out to Fortville or um, like I have some people who are watching this that are relocating from different states and are trying to get a feel for the area or these builders through different interviews, uh, what amenities through the HOA or neighborhood are offered? David. Yeah, sure. So basically we have in this particular community, we do have a, a brand new playground that is available for um, all of the, the folks here in the community. And then there's a, there's a pond here as well uh, with a fountain, which is really nice. Uh, but then there's also ballparks and there's a park just adjacent to the community, uh, which is really attractive. Uh, I spoke with someone um, just yesterday in my model. They love the fact that they can walk through the park on the walking trails out to the park, which is really nice. So those are, are the pretty basic amenities. But, you know, we're not far from walking distance from downtown Fort Bill, uh, which is really nice and be able to enjoy, you know, those summer walks and things of that nature. So yeah, it's it's it, the community gives you all of those things. Yeah, we're we're I mean, Fort Bill's such a you know, in great point for the out of town um, people that are coming in and don't know the area. You know, I, I would say Fort Bill's kind of a more recent hotspot. You know that that has just been turning out amazing. I mean, Fort Bill's just been this kind of nice little small town, and it still is. But now that it's you know that that the area started to grow, it's really unique. Uh, shops, um, restaurants, I mean, just all kinds of neat, you know, uh, local tax man. Um, it just is a uh, 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 Corona's uh, Italian cuisine. Uh, Fox Garden Kitchen is probably one of the more popular restaurants in the area. You know, there, there's, there's, again, Italian food, Mexican food, uh, kind of you name it, and a Dairy Queen. So, I mean, I don't know what else you need more than that, but uh, it's all right. It's all right. <laughs> It's all right there and uh, and just has a really awesome small town feel to it. From what I understand, the Fortville community has really benefited from the overflow of fishers. And that and some of the last studies that I've read were suggesting that it's the second fastest growing municipality in I can't remember if it's a city or a town, uh, forgive me, but um, it's a, a growing city and um, this is embarrassing on a recorded video. <laughs> um, but it's this been the second fastest in the state of Indiana for quite some time and it has been getting the overflow from fishers and 
partially because of um, the school district is still desirable and the price point is therefore more affordable. And all of that, did that make sense? Is that correct? 100% <laughs> correct. And, and I'm hearing that, okay. I'm hearing that every day uh, when folks that walk into the model that are, that are in Fishers and they're con now considering Fortville and now that they know Davis Homes is in Fortville has really been appealing in what I'm hearing. Excellent. Well, what would you say, I mean, Fishers has certainly attracted a number of new build options. And I feel like every time I show houses in Fishers, it, there's a new construction community popping up. And the further east you go, the more likely you are to see them because it's just sprawling. So what would you say as a client is driving around trying to get a feel for the different communities? Um, what would you say from maybe past client experience helps a client choose Davis Homes out of everyone else that's on the road? That's a good question. I think uh, one of the elements would be, as we were just talking, Fortville uh, versus the Fishers. And you say, well, what does that mean? Well, you know, Fishers is, you know, 30 years ago, Fishers was small town. It's not anymore, uh, you know, and, and a much bigger school system. So uh, we see at Park Creek and other area communities that folks are like, you know, we want to get to a little smaller school system, uh, which Mount Vernon Schools is a fantastic school system. So we're, you know, Fort Bell Elementary, we're, uh, you know, Mount Vernon Middle School and High School. But, you know, even if you have student athletes, I mean, your, your likeliness to play, I mean, kind of just call it what it is, is going to be greater in a Mount Vernon school system, uh, in my opinion, than what it probably would be in Fishers. You just there's just more competition for each one of those students uh, to, to make the team. So, and, and just, um, I mean, Fisher's no question, teacher quality is fantastic. Uh, Hamilton Southeastern Schools, Fisher Schools in general have a great reputation. Mount Vernon, uh, again, you know, recognized as a little smaller of a school, uh, definitely an award-winning school system, uh, excellent, excellent teachers and staff. So they're very good in that regard. But I think the main difference is just or maybe want to be a little further out, a little bit further away from all the hustle and bustle. Um, you know, that's really Fordville right now. David, is there anything you would add? You hit it right on the nose. I mean, that's exactly what I'm hearing. Uh, and then not to mention the great schools uh, as well. It's been very attractive. Um, so I'm here, I've been hearing that quite often. So. That makes sense. And it's very consistent. I think that's why a lot of times people, especially from a sports standpoint, um, you know, there sometimes seems to be like the bigger the city, the more politics get involved, or it's almost like you've got to get your kids started super early in certain types of leagues if they want to end up on varsity or have a chance at varsity down the road, which is sad, like it shouldn't be the case, but that's the world we live in, unfortunately. So um, it's neat that that's an option, at least, um, with this community or um, by moving further out, there's certainly lots of benefits. So moving back to an inventory side of discussion and for those watching who are not familiar with the term inventory, that's realtor speak for housing or available housing. And in this context, we don't really have much that's on the market right now. And so that's propelling a lot of sellers, especially to choose to build so that they have security and knowing where they're going to go. So let's talk a little bit about the process of building a home with Davis. How long does it take? What can a client expect when they come in and they fall in love with the floor plan? What are their next steps? A great question. So typically yeah, that our process is very simple. We try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, for example, once, uh, once a, a client or customer decides on a particular floor plan, we're, we're obviously, as you know, we're deciding on a particular home site that would be available for them uh, and within our inventory of home sites. Once we decide that with me, what I'm gonna do is find out all those particular things or options or desired options that they want in their home. As we discover that what those are, uh, we will basically kind of price, we we'll price those out, make sure we stay within their budget. And then the next step is to get them to our design center. And that's the fun part after they, excuse me, let me take one step back. Before they get to the design center, we would have signed a purchase agreement. They would submit it their earnest money, and then we would need a copy of their pre-approval 
Uh, one of the great things about Davis Homes within the last uh, nine months or so is that we have Davis Mortgage, which has been a great tool for all of our customers and saving them, saving them money and time uh, because it's everything is done uh, in-house. So as we go through that process, then we try to get them to the design center which typically is about a 30 day window between the time they've signed a purchase agreement to the time that they meet with the design center. And then from there, you're looking at about a 45 day window once complete, uh, their design center appointment is complete to really getting to that pre-construction meeting, which is vital to make sure that everything that I did with them and everything that they did at the design center is, is on their prints and ready to go. That we have the, the perfect home that they desired uh, is put together at that pre-construction meeting. And now we're gonna dive into the building cycle, which is about a, about, about a four month cycle of, of getting the, the house complete correctly. And then with in, in this con con atmosphere, we're not sure with, with supply and demand at times and all builders are kind of dealing with, with supply and demand. So we try to keep that window pretty flexible and, and set the expectation up front um, that not to, to over promise uh, on those things, but to set the expectation that there could be delays in the process because of everything that is going on with COVID and, and things of that nature that we deal in this in this industry. So, uh, but to get back to the process, you're probably looking in, 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 in the uh, community side, I would say anywhere between six to eight months, uh, depending on uh, supply and demand. That makes sense, Jared. Did you have anything you wanted to add to that, or I mean, David oh, I spoke very eloquently. He he always does. Yeah, the uh, you know I, I think, and I'll just make this statement whether that's us or any other builder. You know, the 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 sooner a customer can make decisions in the process, the sooner we can move through the necessary process to get a building permit and start the home. So. Uh, you know, that's one of those where it's like, you know, make a decision, kind of stay with it. And, uh, you know, changes slow the process. And again, that's, that's any builder. And, and to David's point in today's environment, you know, right now we're ordering materials earlier in the processes than we normally or have done in the past. Because it takes longer to get a lot of them. Appliances and windows are just two examples, but the lead time on them is significantly greater than what it was just a year ago. So when somebody says in the process, "Oh, I want to make a change," that that can be a uh, that can be a delay that we haven't experienced in the past. So you know, in that case, when those things happen, we we we, we just try to be upfront and say we can either make the change or we can't make the change. But if you do make the change, here's the impact on time. So and 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 of course cost. So um, but. You know, no question. Um, the time frame David laid out there is absolutely right on, but but there are certain things that a customer has to do to keep that going, and that's financing. If they need, if the mortgage company is asking them for information, they need to get them the information. Uh, if you know, if it's uh, we need you to decide on that last change so that we can finish your blueprints and get your plot plans and go out for a building permit. Well, again, whether it's us or any other builder, you make those decisions as quickly as possible or that does delay the process more today than again, probably what it did a year ago. Sorry, couldn't hit the mute button. Um, so I love it and I love the detail with the steps too. I think a lot of times clients don't always get to see that level of detail communicated in the steps. like. I think a lot of times people either don't fully understand it, so therefore they're not com confident when they try to explain it, or they yeah. don't think that the customer cares when in fact, a lot of times I think if we over communicate, like you just shared the, the this is the consequence of if you delay here in doing this, this is the, the, the trickle effect. And um, I think that's one thing that I really appreciate about the internet, about social media and doing these types of opportunities is I'm helping communicate the full scope of the construction process because there's a lot more layers to it than um, the meetings that the client tends to have with the uh, sales rep or design center part of the company like um, so it's it's neat to hear that explained and Jessica I think you have to care enough about your customer mm -hmm. to say hey and their family because they're making a move a huge move and you want to make sure you set the right expectation 
But uh, I think it's also important to say, hey, you know, Mr. Whoever or Mrs. Whoever, you know, it is important that you attend your design center appointment so that we can keep you moving right along in the process because you mentioned that your lease expires in X month, you know, mm -hmm. whatever that may be. And in order for us to get as close to that as possible, you have to stay on track. Mm -hmm. Like Jared's mentioned before, getting your financing in line, making sure that you, you get to the design center, don't miss your pre-construction meeting. You know, all those things that are vital in the process. So, um, so we have to, as a company, care more about our, and which we do, about our customers getting through the process so that they can meet their needs and their goals that are important to them. Yes, excellent. I agree 100%. The discussion too around following up and staying in touch with people, I think is so important, not only so that they you build that opportunity of relationship and trust, but also that the client understands the full uh, scope of what's going on. And I think a lot of times when I have conversations with affiliates or builders, people are following up just because they know how fast the market moves. And I think from a prospect side, sometimes I think that's interpreted as, oh, they just want to sell me something so they can make money. And I think a lot of times that's not the case. Um, maybe that's a romantic point of view, but <laughs> I think in our industry, we just know that hey, this lot that's a premium lot that you have your eye on, it's probably going to be gone if you don't make a decision in the next 24, 48 hours sometimes, depending on when the section's released. Um, how fast are you seeing you know, people come out, put a deposit down um, from the time that they maybe first start looking at different communities? Wow, that, great question. Uh, and many times it depends on uh, we have several communities. Left. So not only do we have our, our Park Creek community in Fortville, we have our Prairie Hollow community, which is at USDA in Ingalls, Indiana, starting in the 180s. So we see a demand where folks will come in for really both communities and say, hey, I really want this lot. We will talk about the lot. And I hate to say, hey, you know, I do have somebody else looking at the lot because you don't want them to think that you're trying to sell. But you're really being honest with them and saying, yeah, I actually have three or four people looking at this particular lot. Uh, but you're right. It goes back to the need. But then I also give them other options and other home sites that that would potentially work for our particular floor plan, because in Park Creek, not every home fits on every lot. So we have to make sure we're strategic and I can't place two field view models right right next door to each other. You know, uh, there, there are some modifications and, and things that, as far as requirements in the community that we just can't do those things. So when you're talking about lots, I mean, we can really dive into an hour long conversation about all the different particulars that are there. But the main thing is when someone comes in that time frame, I mean, it's literally has been, I mean, it could be hours. I, I was, we met with somebody on New Year's Eve they came in, <clears throat> we were closed New Year's Day. They came in that next day and put their money down on a, on a home site. So. Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> Good for you guys. Well, great way to start off the new year. Um, what would, advice would you give with someone who's trying to select the best lot for their family? What things should they take into consideration? And are there any uh, features that they or questions that they should ask when evaluating different lots in a neighborhood. You know, um, a couple couple key items is, you know, what are, what what are their needs? You know, if they have children, it might be, you know, more play area. Um, if they're entertaining more, it may be about, you know, the size of a of a patio or deck area or what their outdoor living desires are going to be. And then it probably comes down to some privacy factors as well. Um, you know, what what one home site may back up to versus another. As the example we used earlier, we have a number of uh, home sites in the community that back up to that Memorial Park area. Uh, you know, that for some is they're going to love that, you know, because maybe their kids could be out there in that in the park area playing with a little more, they're almost like their own expanded yard. They can still keep an eye on them for others. You know, that may not have any level of importance to them. So we, we really try to work with the customer based on, you know, 
a discovery session is essentially of you know, what's important to you and then try to find what makes the most, you know, what makes the most sense uh, for their needs. And some of the floor plans are a little deeper than others. So that can impact yard, you know, the, the, the resulting yard size and, and for the backyard. So we'll talk through all those sorts of uh, sorts of circumstances. You know, you may get in some cases, somebody wants to put a pool in. Well, then, you know, we want to talk through, you know, the space that may be necessary for that pool. Uh, but ideally, again, a good understanding up front of what their, you know, short-term and long-term goals are, uh, whether that's inside the home or outside the home, is a critical part of our of our process of working with customers. I agree. And to add to that, uh, at times, I'll just, you know, we'll just walk the community together. We'll get out and, and see what available lots that we have available. And, you know, let's go walk them. Let's see what, what you like about them, what you don't like about them. And uh, and go from there, and make a decision uh, based off of your your needs and wants. I think sometimes too the the trap, or people don't know to ask this or verify, is sometimes the biggest lot isn't always going to give you the best backyard, because sometimes the um, elevation of the land might not be usable or give you the type of um, like for example if you're on a hill and you're expecting privacy but there's a big drainage easement in between are you going to be able to have the privacy that you're expecting to have or is that something that well this lot on paper doesn't look like it's going to be as big but it actually might give you the privacy that you're looking for is that something that um you try to be really good about helping clients understand. I mean, we, we alluded to privacy too, but I don't feel like people, especially when they're looking at a 2D map, can always quantify the elevation changes in a lot. Yeah, and that's why I find it critical to get out and walk the lots. I, I think that is, if you're not walking the lot with your salesperson and, and taking time out to, to you know understand the width and the depth of a lot, where the... Uh, uh, the the front of the home will sit as opposed to where the rear and and I mean going as far as I in my car I have a tape measure that I was given many many years ago to really you know measure out where my where the house sits so and and and, set, and a second pair of shoes you know so mm -hmm. sometimes you have to get out in the mud and you have to walk those lots because if it's that important to them remember this is a big decision you know we're not buying shoes or anything you know we're buying a house and I want to make sure we get it right the first time. Yeah, and I think that can be especially hard to do or feel like people want to do if they don't know when it's like two degrees outside and it's like, oh, I'll just trust the map. But I think setting the right expectations up front for yourself and, you know, just being able to fully appreciate the value of what you're buying and, you know, be able to better compare and visualize, especially because some people aren't visual in nature. There's a saying in real estate that people buy what they see, not what it can be. So I think the more you can get yourself in a position as a buyer to get out there, walk the lot and visualize as much as you're able to, um, that will help you make better decisions. So I love that. Is there anything else on the lot topic that you'd like to share or advice for people to consider? I would just say, make sure you walk in the lot you know, with whomever you buy a home, whether that's with David's homes or anyone, when you select a lot, just don't go off what's on the map. You know, get out there and take a look at it, get a feel for it and 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 have that salesperson, you know, explain to you, you know, the depth, the width and depth of the lot and where would your home actually sit? You know, what, and it's, it's a small item for some and a big deal for others. You know, we have the benefits in new home communities, uh, or the benefit of not having overhead power lines. You know, I mean, you know, that's that's older homes and older neighborhoods. And when you drive through one of those older communities and you see all those overhead power lines, it's kind of yuck. And when you get into the new communities, everything's just cleaner. But the trade off are the are the pedestals that you see on uh, on, on so every so many lots, if you will. And uh, some are going to be small. Some are going to be big. Now, it's important to know that it's not optional. The builder can't move those. And they won't move those or it's incredibly expensive and likely the utility wouldn't approve it anyway. But that's one thing to look at. You know, people landscape around those, uh, but that's another reason you want to get out there and see the lot. You don't want to be in the sales office just looking at a, 
you know, a color marketing brochure. You want to be out there looking at it and go, okay, if I have a pedestal on this lot, whether that's a electrical pedestal, whether that's for, you know, phone service or cable service, which is the small ones, uh, you know, you want, you want to make those decisions eyes wide open. So uh, handing can be a consideration. And handing in the building world is, is, as you look at the home from the street, is the garage on the left-hand side or is the garage on the right-hand side? The floor plan itself is a mirror image that essentially lives the same. But Jessica, to your point earlier about visuals versus non-visuals, you know, sometimes that's really hard for people to visualize. So, you know, if it's going to be a left, sometimes that's because of utility requirements or because of the, the topography differences that kind of dictate that, then, you know, we, you, you have to look at that. So then that builder, may, you may be looking at a model home that's a little, you know, a left-hand garage, that one needs to be a right you know, if you can't visualize it, then work with that builder, maybe in us in this case, of course, to, you know, get you in a design that is that way, uh, but right-handed. So at least, you, again, you're making all those decisions and you're comfortable uh, with the end result. If you're ultimately making the mortgage payments or paying cash, whatever the case may be, and uh, you should be very happy with those decisions. Now, finishing up this segment of the conversation with lots, do you have any particular lot premiums right now in the Park Creek community? Yeah, so our lot premiums range anywhere from a thousand to five thousand dollars. Not very much on the on the grand scheme of things in regards to you know a community that's ranging between two hundred and sixty and, and three hundred and sixty. Yeah. Yeah, you would think. <laughs> Sometimes I walk in and it's like ten thousand dollars, and the elevation upgrades fifteen, and it's like, what? <laughs> what price point are we in? But you know, yeah, you know, every every lot is unique, and uh, so yeah, your your bigger ones could be more, or if they back up to water, they could be more in some of those circumstances. Um, and we like to say we don't have any lot premiums, but we do have premium home sites. So you know. There are, there are some that are more premium uh, than others, again, by some of those factors, by size, by location, by topography, and, and so forth. So you do see some, uh, and in the case of Park Creek, there, there are minor differences, but you do see some minor differences. And some of those are cost-related as well. You know, if you can appreciate you have a bigger lot, uh, that's, and we, you know, have to finish grade that bigger lot, and we have to, you know, maybe but, you know, seed and straw, whatever the case may be, uh, that bigger lot, there's there's also costs associated with some of those too. So, uh, some differences. You mean the builder just doesn't want to take as much money as they can? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, it makes if a lot of sense. Not, it is a business. We not profit, we'd probably go out of business. <laughs> so, it, uh, yeah. Okay, well, I'm just reviewing my questions here. Did you have anything um, before I toss another question your, your way that you wanted to make sure that we communicated to the audience today? No, I would say the one thing that we, that we kind of forgot to add on the plan side is that Park Creek, again, the unique designs, but we also have uh, an awesome new, it's called the Hardwick, but a uh, first floor uh, master bedroom design that is Awesome. Uh, we just built the first one kind of as a prototype and a spec. It sold very quickly, um, but a great design. So if somebody, you know, wants to still have, uh, you know, that, that bedroom on the first floor, then we've got a great choice for them uh, in that regard as well. So, um, but four is a limited, limited choice, but a lot of design options with each one of them, but four di very different designs that people can choose from in Park Creek. And again, you can still slightly customize those. So there's a lot more flexibility with the four than what might be at some other community. Um, yeah. now, there's the, that's the hard wick right there that uh, David is showing. Perfect. Yeah. And does that, it looks like with the dormer that you could have a finished room over the garage. Is that for aesthetic purposes or is that uh, the case? Both. Yeah, both. So we do offer and have that finished space over the garage on that design as well. And that, again, you know, opens up some choices, as David's shown there, for that large, uh, large bonus room. That could be an additional bedroom. We can divide that into study spaces. Again, uh, quite a few choices that, that people could do with that added space. 
yeah i geek out at floor plans so this is this is great um yeah i'm the i'm the type that asks for the booklet of all of them and then i go home and i calculate out the dollar per square foot so then when clients are asking me the those different questions i've got it right in front of me plus if you go early to when the builders op first open you can see the original pricing and see how they've done a markup over time but um so let's kind of wrap up this discussion talking about um again why davis how do you guys address conflict or if someone's watching and they've built with davis and they've you know had an issue after they've built which never happens but if it did happen <laughs> uh, what would you remind them of to contact you or how do you want people to both know ahead of time how you handle conflicts that happen and then um, for maybe homeowners who have built with davis if they have an issue how do you want them to get in touch with you uh, uh, the first step is probably come through our, you know, if it's a, if it's a closed home, you know, um, whether that's a year old or 10 years old, whatever the case may be, then, you know, reach out through our warranty department. And a lot of times you get questions that come in on product, you know, oh, I, you know, want to add X and, you know, I want to use the same style that was in the house when it was built. And, you know, we get people asking for everything from what was the paint color to the, siding color to you know other uh, warranty type questions um, so you know we try to coach everyone up front about what those processes are but even the, the structural warranty you know every one of our homes comes with a 10-year structural warranty that's also a transferable warranty so it can be a case where it's the second buyer or even maybe the third buyer in that 10-year period and they have some questions so we always say direct those you know through through the warranty department of course during the building process we have two primary points of contact, which is, you know, and, and use Park Creek as an example. David is our on-site salesperson. Then we have our uh, an awesome uh, construction team, and our our construction team partner out there. His name is Randy, and uh, you know that the, they can handle. Oh my gosh, ninety nine point nine of anything, a percent of anything that comes up, question wise. It, if if there is something that is you know, well, we just don't agree and, and it needs to elevate to another level if that's what you're asking, Jessica, then, you know, that would, you know, come to me in this case or, or my construction partner, depending on what the question is. And we just try to investigate the facts and find out what a solution is. And some, you know, most cases it's, you know, uh, one person's interpretation over another. And, uh, you know, you just have to kind of get everybody on the same page and, and work for uh, a solution. Um, you know, I, I don't know any builder out there that as much as we say our goal in life is to satisfy every single customer 100% of the time, you know, we also live in the real world and, and, you know, despite how hard we try to do that, that's, that's not always the case. Um, you know, with any builder, I don't know any builder that could, yeah, and in fact, I don't, there's nobody that could claim that 100% of every one of their customers absolutely just loves them to death, even though that's what we want. So, you know, the key is communication. And, uh, and discussion, and, and that's really how we're, you know, we try to work through, uh, you know, any any time that there's anyone that's upset about something. I mean, that's kind of the, I guess, kind of where it comes to. So did that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if I can say that there's necessarily a right answer to that. I think no. it's just, I, no, I try to be sensitive to the, I mean, I guess there's the right answer of, you know, we do our best to handle whatever comes our way, but um, I try to be sensitive to the audience that's watching that could be either interviewing different builders to potentially build with, but then also to those who might have built. And sometimes, you know, people might be reminded at the time of when they're interfacing with you, this is the procedure, but then life happens and people forget. So I think it's just good to revisit. Um, again, but I've heard nothing but good things about you guys and our professional standpoint. That's our goal. So. And we, you know, it's real important for us as a builder when we start the process. So, you know, when, when David's kind of finished the sales side and we've gone through the plans and the selections and now we're ready to start the home and really Randy, who I mentioned earlier, kind of comes into play. And then there's communication through the process that actually comes directly from 
um, the construction side. So we try to set expectations at, uh, we call again, refer to as a pre-construction -pre meeting at, at start. It's not just introductions. We review the prints together. We review the, the plot plan, which essentially shows how the home sits on the home site. Uh, from an expectation standpoint, uh, we'll tell you, you know, somebody's probably gonna break a window. Uh, that's on us to fix. Somebody is, you know, gonna, uh, you know, last minute, they're gonna bump the wall with a ladder. What, you know, those things happen and it's uh, our responsibility then to to make them right. What's different about home building is, is if you compared it to, you know, a, a, an automobile, for example, is nobody sees the assembly line process with the automobile, right? I just get the nice shiny new car, you know, from the dealership. Uh, on new construction, that assembly process is right out in front of everyone. So if my truck had fallen off the assembly line and they had to pick it up and put it back on and put it all back together, I didn't even know that. All I know is at the end of the day, I got a nice shiny new vehicle. Uh, if, if for some reason, our, bad example, the house falls off the assembly line, you know, everybody sees it. And then, you know, then they see us, you know, fix the process. So and that's an extreme example. But, uh, but when things come up, it is right in front, it's all very public. And then we, it's up to us to communicate, uh, you know, uh, again, those misunderstandings of my, a wrong product could get ordered out. You know, somebody, the, the carpet installer might supply it, and, you know, might install the wrong color carpet. Well, then, you know, we take it out and put in the right color carpet. So, you know, there are, there are those sorts of things. And we, I almost promise every customer at that pre-construction meeting that there's going to be some, something that happens. We'll fix it when it happens. Yeah, and I think the important thing is that with every every client, you work to assess the the challenges or what went wrong and how can we keep doing it better. And I think new construction, especially right now, is just under so much pressure, not only from the demand pre-COVID, but demand because of COVID. And then on the back end, like David, you mentioned earlier, the supply chains, like it's not like you can just order a new window and have it be there without this pandemic going on, which I think in some cases, just talking about lumber, like we have wildfires going on in different parts of the country or around the world. And so the, like, that doesn't mean that we should make excuses for things, but I think we just also need to approach the conversation with, like you said, having the correct expectations up front. And I think people are um, like, they're in this situation too. It's not like they're outside of a pandemic <laughs> looking in on it. Um, and so I think a lot of times people are very like receptive to that and understanding. And um, I think too, it's also fun for them to have sometimes more time to understand and to revisit. And I would encourage you as clients to regularly visit your home site and have independent inspections and done, which is something that we haven't talked about today very much, but the um, every builder that I've interviewed always welcomes third-party inspections, and you guys will certainly have your own inspections done by the city, but um, and your own standards of quality. But you know, still having a second, or in this case, technically third-party eyes on it, is always in your best interest. Um, so I, I do want to be respectful of your time because I think we could talk for another hour on this and still not exhaust the subject. But um, for those who are watching this video and they've never built a home before. I'm going to go to David first and then to Jared. David, what is your one piece of advice for people who are considering building a home? Uh, I mean, I've built several times and then working for Davis for many years. The best advice, no matter where you decide to, to build a home, is just to make sure that the builder is inviting in regards to wanting you to be a part of the process throughout the entire, from start to finish. Um, that's something that I encourage uh, every person that I talk to is, you know, I introduce them to the construction manager, whether that's through a phone, email, text, whatever the case may be. And then I encourage them to be a part of that process. Uh, and then, you know, and, and they should be, ch and you should also expect to to have those those weekly or monthly calls, you know, from from salespeople or from construction, um, and that's one of the things where you know a, a sales team should be able to identify their strengths and weaknesses, 
and then be able to improve on those. So I identified some weaknesses that that I had over the you know last 12 months, and then we corrected those because you know the feedback from customers is extremely vital, from realtors is extremely vital, and that you should always be wanting to evolve as a as a builder, as a company, as construction and sales. So, you know, I take those criticisms and feedback seriously. And then we've we've done some amazing things here uh, at, at Davis Homes because we grew so fast. We've been growing and growing and growing. And sometimes you just don't know, you know, you may run into something that you're not, not quite sure why it's happening, but then once you figure it out, then, you know, I go with Jared and we make the corrections. You know, we fix it and, and we take responsibility. We own up to, if, if we made a mistake, we own up to it, you know, and we celebrate the good things and then we fix the things that are challenging for us. And, and that's, that's what you should expect from a builder, in my opinion. I, I, not much I can add to that. I mean, you're, you're right on. I mean, one of the, you know, I guess one example that's communication. You know, the, the world and, and how people communicate is very different. Some people still want a phone call. They want a voice-to-voice -voice conversation. Others are more just send me a text. You know, some are, you know, email me. You know, so, you know, one of the areas that, that we've really discovered is we're trying to ask everybody up front, what's your preferred method of communication? And, uh, you know, so, you know, that's just one small example. But again, we're we're always uh, evolving just like uh, the rest of the world and uh, trying to keep up with it. Yeah, I think that's great. I think sometimes we have a standardized approach to things that could be great in efficiency, but terrible for the user because it's, you know, not how they prefer to communicate. Right. Um, so I, I love that. And I think that's great. And I love David that, you know, I'm in sales too. And, you know, it's, it's definitely been a growing point in, in my career. And I think the times that I've found areas of weakness, it's like, well, why is that? And, you know, you get coaching and you get feedback and you get somebody who helps build up confidence so that you're able to um, overcome those weaknesses, but then also play to your strengths. You know, sometimes um, things in sales that we come in contact with are not always the right uh, fit for us or what we're best suited for. So like, I don't like cold calling. I found that out very early in my career. Um, but I win when I get in front of people and I shine in open houses. Like that's just, and you know, God made us all differently. So it's, it's good that some people are, are one way or another. And I am excited for you because then, you know, this, not that this year isn't going to be awesome, but it's just going to be even better. So Hoots yeah. to you. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's all about expectation setting and making sure that we're always doing the right thing, you know, so I think that's important. Excellent. Well, my last question is going to be slightly self-serving, but it's also for slight argumentative purposes. Why should a prospective client work with a realtor when they are building a new home? That's a, that's a very good question. Uh, you know, I, I would I add a couple things. One, you know, resale is always a big discussion. I mean, people are always talking about, you know, how long am I going to live in the home? And, you know, you have to think about when you're adding options and upgrades, you know, how long are you going to live in the home? I mean, if, if I'm going to be in the home 15, 10 years, that's maybe, maybe the answer is different than if it's going to be five and, you know, how does that impact price? You know, and I'm going to use an example, Jessica, of a, of a swimming pool, right? You know, uh, if you're going to put a pool in the backyard, you should plan on living there quite a, a long time. You're not going to get maybe in the resale value side of that, uh, what it's going to cost you to put it in. You know, so when somebody's adding extras and upgrades, um, you know, that's, that's a discussion that, I mean, the realtor is the expert on that. We know today's trends. You know, we don't, you know, we know, you know, today's, you know, whether that's today's design items or today's building items, but, you know, the realtor side, the broker side is kind of a little more all encompassing, you know, where they're also dealing in, in a resale market that we're, we're not in every day. So we really look to that relationship in a, in a partner way and in which, you know, they're providing that, you know, that type of advice and recommendations 
you know, on, you know, hey, this is something that'll help you on resale. That's something that if you like it, spend the money on it, but it's probably not going to help you on resale. So, you know, those are the kind of conversations in particular. And they're a good, realtors are always a good, uh, you know, third party to, you know, sometimes when there's a discussion, you know, there's, uh, you know, there's uh, uh, two different opinions. They can be the tiebreaker, uh, you know, with, with their professional experiences, you know, to support it. So, you know, we, uh, we make great effort as a, as a builder to work with the realtor community. Uh, one of the differences for our sales team, and, and this is not a knock against other builders, it's just that we, we look for a little wider variety of experience, is, is that almost every one of us are brokers ourselves. So, you know, that's not typical in the building industry in the Indianapolis area, but it is for us. Um, and, and we like that fact that, you know, that uh, uh, at least we, you know, we have access to some of that knowledge uh, as well. But I think it, it supports, you know, our belief that uh, being a realtor and what it takes to be a realtor and the continuing education, people don't realize, you know, all of those factors that a realtor has to go through. You don't just get your license and you're done. You got to keep it up. So you've got a continuing education every year and so forth. So again, we really look at the realtor community as industry partners. Uh, and, and working together uh, as a great benefit for the buyer. And also I would add, you know, having my license is a certain level of accountability mm -hmm. uh, on my part and the other, you know, members of the sales team. You know, we just can't, you know, spat off, you know, uh, random things. We have a certain level of expectations and accountability that we have to, uh, that we've been given this, this light or earned this license. We have to keep it. You know, and you don't want to do those things that are that will prevent you from moving forward with a license. You know, so I think those things are important. I think that makes Davis Homes unique because you're sitting down with people that have something, you know, they have something they can lose in a sense. Mm -hmm. and, and being upfront and honest in, in all of our dealings uh, and, and being brokers is extremely uh, uh, beneficial to the to the client. And uh, I, I enjoy my realtor relations and partners that I work with that 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 believe in what we're doing here and believe in our product and believe in our company and and we encourage realtor um, uh, sales we do a lot of uh, a lot of realtor uh, networking and events together but not only that I, I believe that that realtor is a has a third eye like Jerry said and they're an advocate for the customer why we try to be you know an advocate but you know they say oh would you work for the builder but we still try to be an advocate for them but it's always good when they have an agent so. Not every not every builder is right for every customer. So, you know, like what Jessica is doing today, you know, understanding the differences between the different builders helps her and her team kind of understand, you know, uh, to coach the customer, to coach the clients better about, uh, you know, whether it's the location, the community, because there are a lot of our lifestyle decisions. You know, everyone lives different. You know, they want different, you know, bigger homes, smaller homes less expensive, more expensive. And, uh, you know, they're, they're on the realtor side, you know, they, that's, you're, you're trying to understand the whole market. We're, we're understanding our, our portion of the, of the sandbox, but you know, the, the realtor community has to kind of know all of it. So again, you know, we, we, we work hard to develop those relationships so that when we're the right builder that, you know, that realtors bring their customers um, to us. Yeah. And I think that's awesome. I love, everything that you gentlemen have said uh, for those. Well, I mean, the purpose of this interview series is to help my audience understand what inventory is available because it's a lot of times what comes up on the market is a lot of times a spec home. And so you might not know that a new community is available unless you're actually driving through or, you know, the name of the builder or you're working with an agent who can connect you to different options and communities. But um, my goal is to help um, people across Indianapolis or those who are thinking of relocating here just get, you know, different tastes. And I'm not opposed to interviewing the same builder twice because of different communities. But, um, you know, it's, it's a stepping stone, especially when we're facing an inventory shortage like never before. And, you know, we're expecting new construction to surge even more next year. So, do you think that that's going to be the case or what are your forecasts suggesting? Uh, yes, that we're, our forecast is definitely suggesting uh, strong growth on you know, the real estate market, general interest rates. You know, there's some debate whether they might 
click up just a little bit, but even if they go up a little bit, they're still, you know, at historically low levels. Um, so I think that, you know, from the building side, you know, the biggest challenge that the builders have right now is, re is uh, replacing the land, the developed lots. So, you know, it's finding the, it's finding the ground, and then it's getting it through all the municipal approvals, uh, getting it developed, and then getting it to the point where we can start building homes. So the surge that happened in 2020 uh, has everybody scrambling a little bit for 2021 uh, to, get, uh, to get more land developed. And I think that we'll continue to see that surge, uh, you know, over the, certainly over the next quite a few years. At least all the uh, economic advisors that, that we talk with uh, on a very consistent basis Say, yeah, the market's good. It's a good time for, for people to buy homes. It's a good time to sell your existing home, move into a new home. Um, you know, all of it, it's the right time. So, again, you know, right now we can't, can't complain about interest rates. Um, and, uh, you know, certainly your buying power is much greater today. Uh, and, you know, who knows what it'll be in the future, but we know where it is today. Excellent. Well, um, for those of you who are interested in building with Davis and would like to partner with me as your agent through that process, uh, please register for a new construction appointment at my calendly.com link. It will be in the comments section of this post, but then also uh, verbally it's calendly.com backslash Jessica Morrison. And if you'd like to research the Park Creek community, um, what uh, website would you send people to David? I would send them out to davidshomes.com, uh, select on the uh, where we build, click on the community link, and it will take you to our communities with uh, Park Creek as one of them. Excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for your time. We did go a little bit over, but um, it was a very good discussion, and I look forward up to a follow-up interview on the uh, where you can build with Davis. or What was the term you used? Uh, the on your lot construction? Yes. 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 Yeah. Um, yeah, we're, we do build rural and uh, on scattered lots all across uh, central Indiana. Excellent. Well, yeah. thank you, gentlemen, for your time. It was a pleasure getting to know you both better and learn so much from you. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you.